In a world of constant change and innovation, trust is key, knowledge is power, and the inside track is everything. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Bruce Whitfield. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Inside Track. It is really good to be with you once again. Norman Rod has had his white shoes covered up by a table, but I assure you, we've done a DNA test, and it is he. It is most certainly the same person. Also, Nontlantla Maisela, who is the co-founder and managing partner at AWIP Investments with us today as well, as we talk about the state of the property market, the state of investment markets, the rising global inflation trend, rising interest rates, and the huge negativity that is gripping the world at the moment. Broad brush strokes, Norman. What's the mood like? What's your mood like in the world of property? Yeah, so we, <clears throat> Bruce, I can only speak about what's happened over the last couple of weeks. And um, obviously with this uh, interest rate hike and the petrol price going up, uh, we're facing challenges now when we thought things had stabilized and there was a bit more certainty and uh, uh, everything was starting to find its way after COVID. But um, we're now facing more serious challenges and obviously we've got to deal with it. I mean, we found that um, Properties aren't being sold like they were in the beginning of the year. Um, we've had a great auction. There was a lot of people attending. There were a lot of participants, a lot of buyers. Um, but the prices have actually um, declined. You know, what we were expecting to achieve, the prices are lower. Uh, there was a lot of participation, a lot of bidding. Um, and it's what I call trophy or trauma. I mean, the properties that are selling are the properties that need to be sold by the sellers. Uh, they have to accept what they receive. And if, if the price is right, uh, there is competitive bidding and those are being sold. And obviously the trophy properties, the properties that never find their way to the market um, due to their position or basically the, the, the high profile, the kind of the property is, they've been sought after maybe because of the income that they, that they bring to the table. But we are facing massive challenges and the listed sector um, are wanting to dispose of their non-core assets or their smaller assets and they're finding it very, very difficult because there are no buyers at those levels. I still believe, and I've said this and I've maintained this over the last couple of months, that the prices are, are they're just too high and uh, for the real price and the real value in the market, what a willing buyer is prepared to pay. And here's the problem, Norman. It's not going to get any easier any time soon. I've just come back from the World Economic Forum in Davos, where the world is petrified of a couple of things, most notably broken supply chains, which are constraining supply of goods and products across the world, driving up inflation. That's forcing central banks to raise interest rates. And there's a pandemic of higher interest rates around the globe now as well, which certainly is not going to help until the, the inflation beast is brought under control. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you, we've been talking the same tune for a while and it's getting worse. I mean, at the end of the day, um, we're, in a, we're in a very fortunate space to see what a the actual activity is out there. And I must say that, you know, the people that need to sell and want to sell the people when it's their own money, you know, and I, I'm not um, trying to criticize uh, the certain funds, but when it's basically shareholders' money and they, they, they've got a war chest and basically they've, they've got certain levels to which they, they don't really need to sell, they hold onto the properties and are waiting for the storm to, to, to be over. Unfortunately, for the private person or the corporates, and the, they need to sell. And I think we're facing some challenges now with the government. I think there are a lot of... Uh, basically private sector participation talks, and I think the government needs to come to the party and say, listen, yes, some non-core assets, we don't need them, we, we're never gonna develop them, they're never gonna be part of our infrastructure, let's work with the private sector and let's possibly try and sell them off and to raise money to, to clear the debt and to fix infrastructure and all those kind of things. And I think that's where we play, where we can bring the real value to the market and, and offer them our sales platform and, and sales solution. Uh, I, I remember when the Minister of Smart Airline Uniforms um, was in, in briefly finance minister and was talking about the sale of non-core assets. That was 2017 or thereabouts when the second time Brevin Gordon got fired. It was all very, very messy. Oh, my goodness me. Norton, are you feeling it as heavily as the guys at Brawl are feeling it? Are you feeling the sort of pressure in the property market, the sort of quite, quite, quite a restrictive environment? Sure, Bruce. I, I mean, I'm listening to Norman, and, and I guess the sentiment continues to be negative. I think my approach to 
commercial property in the near future is cautiously optimistic. And I say that because if you look at the last, I suppose, five months, um, you know, the, the listed sector performance has been positive um, in terms of distribution uh, per share growth. You've seen some double digit distribution per share growth. And that's largely driven by what's happening on the ground, right? And that is in relation to improved tenant activity. So we see quite a lot of tenants coming back into the market, looking for space, wanting to occupy space, securing long uh, uh, tenured leases, i.e. three to five years versus you know, six months to a year where they're trying to build in um, you know, security for uncertainty. So there's a lot of action on the ground which is driving performance, right? Particularly um, in the listed space. I mean, in saying that, I think they're coming off quite a low base um, in terms of COVID performance. So there will be some form of normalization. So I'm certainly more, more optimistic, I guess, um, wearing a landlord hat. Um, th there's definite sentiment. I think the fundamental point about property, Bruce, is that the underpin is always sentiment and economic growth. So some of the factors that you've mentioned from a macroeconomic perspective, rising inflation, rising interest rates, um, the war in Ukraine just is, is extended uncertainty, right? We've just come out of COVID. We're hoping hoping for things to normalize for a certain period of time. But I guess something that I've come to accept is that there, there is no normality in the world anymore, and we just have to find a way of operating in a very uncertain environment. But for anybody with cash, I look at this environment and I say, cheeky offers have got to be the order of the day. You see a property that you know that you could utilize into the future, and surely opportunists in times like this or those who succeed long term. People who in 1987 were not handing the keys into the bank manager and running and flying off to Perth or wherever it was that they were going to in those days. People who are willing to take a bet on the long term are in prime bargaining seats, non Atlanta. Absolutely, Bruce. I, I guess, you know, the key there is capital, right? So, so whoever wants to uh, go after investment opportunities that are priced at discounts in this market has to have the capital, i.e. the equity and the debt required to be able to acquire those properties. And Norman will tell you um, that capital is, is scarce in our market um, and it is becoming expensive with interest rates going up, etc. So, so I think, you know, there are specific um, investors that are able to be opportunistic um, in acquiring some of these properties, but they've got to have the right capital and the ability to turn those properties around. I think some of the bargains also come with their challenges in relation to enhancing the value of that property. You've got a lot of properties that are sick, sitting with vacant pockets. You've got a lot of tenants that are you know, at risk. So you've got to have the ability to actually enhance the value of the property, i.e. secure the income in the long term and be able to manage the, the operating costs. So, so I think for me, it's a, it's a, it has to be a winning formula, right? You're buying low, but you've got to be able to see that value um, in the near term. And the question here, Norman, and you suggested earlier that the really good stuff is not coming to market. It is more of the peripheral properties. I was going to say something less polite, but uh, properties that are not massively strategically appealing necessarily that are coming to the market. Are we still waiting for the really good stuff to start coming in? Yeah, I don't know if you're going to see much of that good stuff coming to the market, uh, to be honest with you. I think, uh, you know, property is where you want to be in the long term, and I think they're going to hold on to their good assets, and they're going to try and work the, the B grade or the C grade a assets. But, I mean, the good assets are going to be hold, held on to. But I mean, you know, for buyers, I, I, we get calls all the time from buyers saying, listen, we want to buy. We've got money, we're sitting with some cash. But I think the real uncertainty for them to, to invest is what are the actual costs of the property? Where is it going to be down the line? What are the, the actual infrastructure costs, the holding costs, the utilities? So it's, you don't make a profit when you sell. You actually make a profit when you buy, how much you pay for it. Because at the end of the day, if you, you, you might be thinking that you're getting a good deal by paying for something today. Um, but you, if it's an uncertain property and the utilities that are coming along with it and the vacancy factor, you know, you could be in for, for a proper um, headwinds down the line. Are we finding, Norman, different regions being managed better in terms of expectations? If you're somebody sitting in the city of Johannesburg right now, it's a little bit wild and woolly as to where your rates bill is going to be five years from now. In other jurisdictions, perhaps a little bit more predictable. And that predictability, I suppose, is what investors are looking for. Yeah, well, um, you know, 
fact, this rates discussion with me is actually a bit difficult because I'm not too sure how they work out the rates because um, we've seen devalue or revaluations and the declining values of properties, especially in the Johannesburg CBDs, but the rates keep going up. So I think they need to get that house in order. Um, but the, when you go to the likes of, of Cape Town and, and the Cape, I think there is a bit more predictability. And, and you know, investors, and I say business people, uh, they're actually starting to invest in their basically head offices to be basically relocated to Cape Town. I think just because of the whole kind of feeling of the, of, of the infrastructure support system there is better than it is here in, in, in Gauteng. And that's a concern, of course, not Atlanta. I mean, here, here we sit with a, a big asset class, a massive asset class. There's an asset class that is capital intensive, capital heavy. It's a long term investment. And without certainty for the long term, people are going to sit in the sidelines. Absolutely, Bruce. I think the, the point around, um, you know, operating costs is, is a fundamental one to, to a property investor. I mean, we've seen, um, you know, income growth, rental income growth, for instance, at, you know, 4 to 5%, while operating costs are going up um, by 7 to 8%, um, and largely driven by rates and electricity. So I think property fundamentals are driven by your ability to um, secure the income and be able to, to have operational efficiency in the building. If you don't have that, um, that certainty, because of factors that are outside of your control, i.e. lack of infrastructure certainty, increased rates, electricity, insurance, very hard to make the property business model um, work relative to other investments, right? But in saying that, I think we're going back to basics now in the market. Property fundamentals have to be sound. You are going to see returns in the long term. It really is a long-term game. And I think it's a, it's a change of mindset to people that have operated in the sector in the last 20 years that have enjoyed tremendous growth, right, in, in the upside of the market where, you know, deals were done, ridiculous deals were done. You were buying properties at inflated valuations because you actually just didn't care um, because the market was running so much. So it really is a rebase. It's back to solid property fundamentals and really patience from, from an investor perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you may take some comfort from this, or maybe it's cold comfort, but I was on a panel in Davos, and there were three people of various ages, one young guy in New York City, developing properties and taking properties off the grid and making them more self-sufficient, purely from an economic perspective and a sustainability perspective. So driven by different, I think, fundamentals as to what South Africa is driven by. And I wonder just how long it's going to take to get commercial property to be self-sufficient of local authorities, and whether that isn't a selling point for the future. Um, either one of you, who you want to pick up on that? Sure. So, so look, I think we've got unique problems in South Africa or challenges in relation to our ability to be independent of, um, you know, the ailing infrastructure that we have. Um, and, I mean, top of mind is electricity. You talk about sustainability and creating green buildings that are completely independent, um, you know, of the major infrastructure. It's very difficult, Bruce. I think there's, there's certain um, macroeconomic shifts that have to be put in place. And, and I think Norman spoke to the to the to the you know private uh, public partnership um, discussions, particularly in relation to infrastructure, I get a sense that there is a there's some form of urgency in actually implementing some of the ideas, the independent power producers, etc. But unfortunately, our challenge in South Africa is always the ability to convert these things quickly. Um, so, no, I guess the question is, what do you do in the meantime? I mean, we would love to be off the grid with some of our properties. And, and from a cost perspective, um, it makes a huge difference. But, but it's timing, right? With, without the infrastructure, it's very difficult to do so. Um, although, you know, good strides have been, have been made in terms of um, you know, green building development, et cetera, et cetera, but still quite a lot of reliance on, on public infrastructure. Absolutely, Norman. I mean, is it time to start declaring force majeure, perhaps, or something a little stronger in the property sector and saying to local authorities, look, unless you can start providing certainty of, it, or, of services, um, we can have a problem in terms of actually developing. Stain City was developed with a huge understanding of building its own roads infrastructure and so much of its own infrastructure going in there. You know, we can retrofit properties in South Africa, but we need some guarantees from your side. I don't know how far down you are with those negotiations and those sorts of discussions. So, I mean, I can tell you, we've, 
we've heard that there are some municipalities that basically don't uh, provide the water to certain areas, and actually the, the, they've, they've taken over the, the council um, in that regard, and they've been able to provide water and electricity. Uh, I think in the, the northwestern areas, there's some towns that are that, that has happened. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we live in South Africa and we've got to make things work. And uh, uh, if they're not working for us, we've got to look at alternatives. Um, and if that's talking to the government and trying to work out a, a private sector participation, I mean, it should be to add value to the overall uh, well-being of our country. So, you know, there, there are discussions I had, but for us, we're trying to sell properties. That's our business, is to try and do deals. And, you know, we've got to make sure that this environment is, con is conducive to that. You know, we've got to make sure that the, the, the values are right and the, their certainty going forward so that they know short-term, medium-term and long-term where they're going to be with their investments. So, Nortland, let's go full circle to Norman's early point, and he going, it's trophy or trauma. So it's either beautiful property like we saw uh, go under the hammer by a brawl in the form of the, the wonderful um, estate of, what was his name? Uh, uh, what was the guy's name? Who built the house? Who built the house? Palazzo. Oh, uh, uh, summer place. Summer place. Summer place, there we go. It, it's sold now, I've forgotten exactly what it was called. It, it's either those sort of trophy properties, Nontlanta, or it is really some less salubrious properties. Are we gonna, how are you feeling about finding a happy medium in this property market in the shorter term? It doesn't feel like either of you is terribly optimistic. Sure, Bruce, I, I guess it's a pricing thing. It depends which side of the, se the table you, you, you're sitting at. Um, you know, the, the trophy properties are, are still highly priced in, in, in my perspective, unless they are distressed, right? Um, so, and if you look at specific sectors, for instance, um, industrial being the flavor of the month, logistics, and the pricing of those type of assets is driven by demand in that specific sector, but the pricing is not sustainable. You know, you, you, you're talking yields of between six to seven percent for a property asset with 10 years of, of cash flow, it's, uh, it's overpriced, but it's driven by, by demand. Um, you know, if, if you then on the other side of the spectrum where you're wanting to buy low and you want to convert and enhance the value, it's, it's really, again, looking at the property fundamentals. So you could look at a property that, you know, is, is commanding a cap rate of 12 to 15 percent. However, your ability to convert and actually achieve value is almost impossible because without a, a paying tenant um, and you being able to manage the operating costs, you could buy that property at a 20 percent cap rate and you're still not going to make money. Um, so, so it swings and roundabouts. I mean, it depends which, which hat you're wearing. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, I think it's a, it, it is a variable depending on, on, on who you are. If I'm buying property, I'm not going to buy properties at That's 7%. Right. Um, but I am looking at opportunistic uh, properties where I can enhance value. So I'd like to just butt in there. Um, and I, I'll just tell you a little bit of a, a story. So they, I'm not going to mention names and I'm not going to mention companies, but uh, I know you're going to press me for them, but they're not, it's not going to happen. So um, a, a, CEO, a CEO of a listed fund recently resigned or over the last couple of years, and they've, they've gone on their own. Um, and when they were selling properties, it was always pressed to get the highest possible price. And I mean, the yields were even nine or sub nine. They, they are now um, representing themselves in a private, uh, basically, uh, factor, and they buy buying properties, and they're not looking at any properties less than 15%. Um, so, you know, there, there's a large gap between actually representing other people's money uh, and your own money. So you're obviously trying to get the best possible deal if it's for your private and for maybe for the... For the shareholders, you're obviously trying to sell at what you can only sell for, so it's not basically dilutionary. Um, and that brings its challenges to the market, because I think um, to stimulate the, 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 the property market, there's a lot of properties that are sitting in the listed sector or in the, in the corporate sector and in the government um, ownership entities that actually need to find their way to the market at realistic prices that will stimulate the property, buyers back investing, uh, upgrading, developing, investing into these properties all around the country, and we'll see a massive um, investment into the economy in itself. But they need to find their way to the market, and I think that's what needs to happen uh, from the outset. 
What's going to be the one catalyst, Norman, as we wrap up? That one catalyst, what is going to be the thing that gets, you know, usually when you see a big truck, these, these muscle men who pull these big lorries, as soon as the wheels start moving, they get a bit of momentum and off they go. What's going to be the guy with the ropes over his shoulders? No, well, listen, we're faced with a few challenges that <laughs> Norman has already mentioned. I mean, interest rates and, and things like that like that but I think I think there are buyers out there and I think the price if there's a price correction across the board with with the with the selling price of these these assets I think um, that together with me I strongly believe that government participation looking at the rates of the properties uh, giving something that is that has got a little bit of give to give back to the market um, and and participation in developing non-core or, or defunct properties um, will help stimulate this economy uh, and this country in the property sector. Norman Rath, thank you very much indeed, Chief Executive of Borough Properties and Auctions, and also to Nontlantla Maisela, who is the co-founder and managing partner at AWIP Investments. Thanks very much for joining us on Inside Tracks. <laughs>